Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're getting enthusiastic about artificial intelligence, teaching computers language, with special guest Dr. Janelle Shane, who runs the blog AIWeirdness.com and is the author of You Look Like a Thing and I Love You, which is a fun new book about AI. But first, we have some announcements. It's a new year, and we have new, big, exciting plans for the Lingthusiasm Patreon page. We are introducing a Discord, which is an online chat space for patrons to share their Lingthusiasm with their fellow Lingthusiasts. We've heard from a lot of you that you got into linguistics because of Lingthusiasm, or it reawakened your memories of how much you like linguistics because you did some courses on it way back when, uh, and now you wish you could talk about linguistics more. So we're giving you a space where you can talk about linguistics, share your interesting linguistics links that you come across, talk about them in a space with other Lingthusiasm fans. We're really excited to see what this community becomes. It's a bit of an experiment, but we think it'll be really fun to do. So you can join the Patreon at the tier where you get bonus episodes as well, and you also have a space to talk about those bonus episodes and the regular Lingthusiasm episodes and any other linguistics things you want to talk about. We want to see more Lingthusiasm, not just online, but also on all kinds of things, which is why we are also sending stickers over the next few months to patrons at the Lingfabet tier. So patrons who are at that tier for three months or more will get stickers that say Lingthusiast on them. So you can stick that to your laptop, your water bottle, your notebook, anything else in your life. And because the original trial round of stickers that we did with the special offer last year were really popular, uh, so we thought we'd provide a way for you to do that around the year, you can join that tier on Patreon as well. You can get other items at our lingthusiasm.com slash merch page, but the stickers are an exclusive for our patrons. So thanks to everybody who's been a patron so far. We're really excited to see you in the Discord, and we're excited to get to try that out. And our last exciting announcement is that our patrons also helped us meet a new funding goal, which means that we now have some additional Ling Ministration support. So our fantastic producer, Claire, who's been with us since the very beginning, uh, is also going to be taking on some more of the administration for the podcast. So you'll see her around a bit on social media and on Patreon, and you can listen to a bonus episode with Claire uh, if you'd like to get to know her better as well. Our current bonus is on the future of English and what English might look like in a couple of centuries from now, inspired by Gretchen's New York Times article. So you can get access to this episode and 34 other bonus episodes. That's like twice as much Lingthusiasm that you can listen to at patreon.com slash Lingthusiasm. Hello, Janelle. Welcome to Lingthusiasm. Hi, it's great to be here. Janelle, we are so excited to have you on the show today to talk about how we can make machines do language. I think one of the things that we have in common, definitely one of the reasons I enjoy following your blog and Twitter feed and so on, is that both linguists and your approach to AI like poking at systems and kind of seeing where they break. Yeah, for (laughs) sure. So I want to, in case some people aren't already following you on all of the internets, I want to kind of give people an idea of like some of the stuff that you have tried to make break. So Janelle, in your work for people who haven't seen it, you take large data sets of particular sets of terms or particular language genres, I guess, and then you feed them into an artificial intelligence. And we'll talk about what that is later. And then it spits out these delightfully whimsical outputs that it takes inspiration from the data set that it's given. And I I have like a sustained history of laughing inappropriately <laughs> loudly on public transport while reading your blog because the results are always so entertaining. Um Gretchen, do you have a favorite to share with us so I can chortle inappropriately? Uh Lauren, I think we should start with ice cream because I know you have a deep and abiding love of ice cream and Janelle has come up with ice cream flavors. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Janelle, where did the ice cream data come from? Did you have a list of ice cream flavors that someone gave you? Or? Yeah, in this case, uh, it 
was a group of middle schoolers, actually. There's a school in Austin, Texas called Keeling Middle School, where uh, there was a group of uh, students in the coding classes who decided that they, they saw my blog, they wanted to do it too, and they wanted to generate ice cream flavors. That's so great. Yeah. So the thing is, you know, I had looked at that and I'm like, oh, this would be cool. And then I looked online and I said, I need examples of exist- existing ice cream flavors because the AI has to have something to imitate. Like it doesn't know about ice cream flavors unless I have some to tell it about. But I, you know, they're scattered around. There wasn't any big master list of them. And so I kind of said, oh, well, I guess that's not going to work. And then these middle schoolers kicked my butt uh, because they (laughs) went and there was, I don't know, dozens of them, 50, 60 of them, like a lot of them. And each of them went and collected a few from this site or that site. You know, each one site would only have a few at a time. They had to manually copy and paste into this data set and they just, you know, through the sheer numbers and having the time to do it, like they put together this amazing data set of existing ice cream flavors. Wonderful. So these middle schoolers ended up getting about 1,600 different ice cream flavors, whereas I had only managed to get together 200. And with a data set that much bigger, it made a huge difference. Like they started generating pretty amusing flavors. So I've got the blog post up about the ice cream flavors from the middle school students, and some of them are really good. (laughs) So there are these like whimsical flavors like It's Sunday, and Cherry Poet, and Brittle Cheesecake, and Honey Vanilla Happy. Like, these seem like kind of reasonable ice cream flavors, right? I'd be open to ordering a vanilla nettle. (laughs) (laughs) Cherry, cherry, cherry. If you like cherries, this is the flavor for you. Yes. And then there are also some kind of weirder flavors from this data set, like chocolate finger and caramel book. Yeah. And washing chocolate. Texas Charlie covered stunt. Mmm. And then there's this kind of like even weirder category, nuts with mattery, brown crunch, mm-hmm. cookies and green. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Oh, so close and yet. <laughs> Mango cats. <laughs> so, like, they're weird to us because of the semantics of them, just to be linguisty and and spoil the moment for a second. <laughs> but they still are English words, or they look like something we recognize mm. as English words, even though I don't think mattery is a word that I know of. And so, like, I think it's worth saying artificial intelligence doesn't know what ice cream is, right? Right. It's just using this list of flavors to figure out what kind of patterns could fit into that list. Exactly. And it's doing it at a very basic level, like what kinds of letters tend to come after other letters? And, you know, what letters are we often finding in combination? Which letters are we never finding in combination? And it'll learn frequent words like chocolate or something. It'll learn how to spell that after some false starts during training. But yeah, without it had any concept of what chocolate is. So if it ends up with something like Vervet's Caramel Borfel, (laughs) you know, it learned caramel, but who Vervet and Borfel are, I I don't know. That's just like randomly combining some letters in ways that are kind of probable as English words. Yeah, it's like a little, it's like a kid who learns how to write and immediately starts putting down letters on paper. Like, is this a word? Is this a word? How do you pronounce this? Mm. <laughs> and how does the... Because, you know, obviously we train the neural nets that are children's brains by talking to them a lot and giving them more input and taking them to school and, and doing those kind of things. But a neural net type artificial intelligence that we're doing this kind of training by giving it lots Mm -hmm. of data. How does it know if it is generating something that's more or less English? Is there a little like thing in the computer saying, good work computer? (laughs) So what it's trying to do, how it, knows it's making any progress at all, is its job is to try and predict the next letter or the next combination of letters. And then it checks its prediction against like some example of real text that it hasn't seen before that it like saved aside to check itself with and said, okay, did I guess close or am I still way off? Am I going to have to like 
change my internal structure so that my guess would have been better and see if going forward that's going to be an improvement. So it is a sort of, it's like a trial and error guess and check. And when you look at the different sorts of stages, because it goes through several different generations, right? So it might start out with just like, here's a bunch of E's because E is really common. And then the, mm -hmm. the check is like, yeah, but you could do better. Yeah. It's like guessing lots of E's is more correct than guessing lots of question marks or lots of Q's. But yeah, it has to say, oh, well, maybe I could work in an S from time to time. And what do you know? That's slightly more correct and proceeds from there. So that's how it learns chocolate, because it might go in with CH and HC. Mm -hmm. And every time it goes, is HC right? Is HC right? And the data set is like, nah, not really. But when it's got the CH for an ice cream list, it's like getting lots of positive feedback. Yeah, exactly. That that's going to appear in chocolate and chip and cherry. Yeah, exactly. So the process, yeah, it is a lot different from a human child learning language because it's uh, it's taking place really in isolation with no other context. So it's as if you are setting somebody in a room with just like, you know, a few dictionaries or a few encyclopedias written in the language that they don't understand. But it's even harder for the AI because it doesn't have like a concept of what language even is to start out with. It's all just guessing what comes next in this sequence of arcane symbols. Or even guessing, they don't. it doesn't have a sense of like what's probable in the world either, right? Yeah. Because you have some of these flavors like peanut butter slime, which those are all English words. Mm -hmm. It's just it would make a terrible ice cream because slime and peanut butter and ice cream are not things that go together. Yeah, exactly. Or if I'm getting it to generate Halloween costumes and it'll come up with zombie school bus. And it's like, okay, zombie school bus, you know, <laughs> there's magic school bus. Like, why is that more likely than zombie school bus? We know it doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, it doesn't have any of that sort of real world knowledge or like that you can uh, do. Or like mango cats. What does it mean for a cat to be mango? I don't know. <laughs> so if an artificial intelligence gained sentience, it's likely it actually wouldn't be a very good linguistic student because it doesn't really understand the concept of, you know, sounds. It doesn't seem to have a lot of understanding of the structure of a sentence we talk in one episode about you know, syntax essentially being this, like, structure that we can hang other bits of sentences off. It has much more of a flat, just looking at the, the patterns on the surface kind of approach to language. Yeah, and keep in mind, too, like, the amount of computing power it has to work with is so much less than what it takes for sentience or anything near human level. You know, if you're looking at raw computing power, the neural nets we have today are somewhere around the level of an earthworm. Maybe an earthworm would like peanut butter slime flavored ice cream. I'll give all my peanut butter slime to the earthworm. <laughs> Very generous of you. This was one of the analogies that I liked in your book, which I enjoyed very much. Uh, you look like a thing and I love you. The title of this book was named after another uh, neural net, right? Mm -hmm. This was a phrase generated from a neural net that was trying to do pickup lines. I, I guess that could be a pickup line. So we have things like ice cream names and you've done, you know, death metal names and mm -hmm. uh, Halloween costumes and colors. And these are all kind of three or four words at most. Pickup lines is moving into more of a like sentence, couple of sentences type of thing. As the amount of words you're trying to generate grows longer, how much more difficult does that make it for the artificial intelligence? It makes it a lot more difficult. So when I was generating the ice cream flavors and things, like I was deliberately going exclusively for these kinds of problems where it would just have to do a couple words at a time because when it tried to do longer phrases or sentences – it would not make sense. So one of the things is that the AI I was working with at the time didn't have very much memory at all. So it would kind of lose track of things that happened a couple of words ago. And it wasn't really able to figure out then how to make a sentence work or make phrases work. That was, yeah, it was a bit beyond it. So the pickup lines was definitely a case of this is too hard for the AI and it struggles. Like, Okay, not just the how do you make a grammatical phrase, but also how do you 
uh, do puns? How do you do innuendo? Like these are all things that require a lot of background knowledge that this thing just did not have. Another example you use in the book is uh, with recipes, right? So like they, it, you know, it can figure out that you need to list some ingredients and you need to list some instructions, but then those instructions won't contain the ingredients that were previously mentioned necessarily because it doesn't remember that those were what it listed before. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see that. And so you'll get something that like on the surface at first glance looks like a recipe. And then when you actually read more closely, you're like, wait a second, it has no idea what's going on. It's forgotten its ingredients. It's telling me to, you know, chop the milk into cubes. Like this is something's <laughs> going on here. Yes, there is something very confident about the way it fakes its ability. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, part of the reason it is, sounds so confident is that it's copying what humans have written. And humans generally didn't tend to write in the middle of a recipe, uh, wait a second, I have no idea what's going on. So <laughs> it does, it learns that is not a phrase that appears in a recipe. <laughs> so it's not going to express any kind of confusion. It's just going to plow ahead with its best guess at what a human would say. And this is where I think your, your famous giraffe question comes from. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, this is a, Oh, I love this chatbot. It's a chatbot called Visual Chatbot. And it's designed to answer questions about an image. So you show it an image, and then it comes up with a caption. And then you can have like this back and forth conversation with the bot about what it sees in the image. But you know, you think that premise would be fairly straightforward. But there are weird quirks that arise just because this thing is trying to copy how humans ask and answer questions about images. So the training data is important. So in this case, the training data is a whole bunch of people hired through Amazon Mechanical Turk to take turns asking and answering questions about images. And then the chatbot was trained on answers. So given this kind of image, given what, you know, what the question is, what would humans tend to answer in this situation? But some weird quirks kind of emerge <laughs> just from that premise. Uh, one of the things that they wanted to make sure to avoid was this thing called priming. So people tend to ask questions to which the answer tends to be yes. And they found like in an early version of this chatbot, the thing could get like 80% accuracy just by answering yes to every single yes or no question. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> so they ended up having to hide the image from the person who was asking questions. So that helped a little bit. And now it's about 50 50 if you ask a given question, whether it's going to answer yes or no to that. But one of the things that they weren't able to correct uh, was this sort of interesting thing with the giraffes. <laughs> so what happens is if you ask the question, how many giraffes do you see? The chatbot will almost always return a non-zero answer. So it can be doing great about an image and be like, oh yeah, this is a person on a snowboard, there's snow... Up until the point where you ask, and how many giraffes are there? And it will answer three, or two, or too many to count. And I think it's just worth clarifying to really, just to really make this clear. This is not a data set in which giraffes appear in every image. True. Yes. <laughs> I would love to see that data set, snowboarding with giraffes. <laughs> yeah, there, there are three giraffes. Yeah, yeah. Giraffe snowboarders. Yeah. This is possible because I, I know this is like a, an ongoing joke that you have. And so I, I tested it with a, an image of the cover of my book, which, as I think everyone knows, contains zero giraffes because it's not about giraffes. <laughs> and Visual Chatbot told me that it is a sign that says unknown, unknown, unknown on the side of it, which I guess is not the worst for a, a cover that has text in it. Mm -hmm. You just can't read the text. Sure. And then I said, how many giraffes? And Visual Chatbot said two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes from this thing is copying how humans tend to answer this question. And in its examples of humans hired through Amazon Mechanical Turk, the humans had not tended to ask the question, how many giraffes are there, when they didn't know if there were any giraffes. <laughs> right. So you'd say something like, are there any giraffes? The person says yes, and then you say, how many giraffes? Exactly. So if you ask the chatbot, are there any giraffes? 
it will answer no quite often. But then if you follow up with the question, and how many giraffes do you see? It'll say five. (laughs) (laughs) This approach reminds me of, as Gretchen said earlier, like as soon as I get my hands on some kind of thing that's doing this kind of back and forth question asking, or as soon as I'm let loose on a kind of Google Translate, um, I I think it's a very like linguist brain thing to try and find these points at which the computer can't handle language properly. And it's, it's always great when you have an approach that understands how humans actually interact with this data that helps explain why you end up getting these really strange answers and why it's good to have linguists help design artificial intelligence or chatbots and these things because the way humans choose to do language is very different to what we think of as like the nice straightforward application at the end. Yeah, there's so many startups that have tried to have like some kind of bot that you can interact with in an open-ended manner and then they run into trouble. Like uh, Facebook M is one of these uh, services that was discontinued last year uh, because They thought it was going to be like a digital assistant lives in your browser. You can ask it to do things like look up show times and stuff. But what people ended up asking for was the weirdest, most complicated things. Like one guy documented, oh, yeah, he asked it if it could arrange for a parrot to visit his office. (laughs) And so, I mean, you're not going to prepare for that when you're training one of these chatbots. So it turned out to be... The chatbot kept needing humans to step in and rescue it, and they realized it was going to be too expensive because they were always going to need these humans. And this is a company that has no shortage of resources to throw at a problem like this. Yeah. Yeah, and I think if you tell people, like, oh, this, you can interact with this like a human, they think they can do things like make a request for parrots, because humans can understand a request for parrots, even if I can't personally deliver you a parrot, at least I understand this request. Whereas a chatbot, if it's not parrots aren't in the trading data, then parrots aren't don't exist. Yeah, and this is one of the things too that kind of makes it hard to tell the difference between humans and computers when you're chatting with them. Like if you're in a customer service situation and you know, they try to really narrow the context in which you can ask questions and not make it uh, open-ended, especially if they're going to invisibly use bots, because they don't want you asking for parrots out of the blue. Right. It's kind of like when you call into a customer service line, it's like press yeah. one to talk to this, press two to talk to that. They really want to keep your options constrained because then the computer can help you. But it's when it's open ended and people start behaving as if it can do anything that a human can do that you start running into problems. Yeah. And so what you'll get is you'll get these companies that'll build chat bots where it'll start out as an open end conversation with something that is secretly a bot, but hasn't said it is. But then if it gets confused, it will invisibly hand control over to a human. And that can be problematic because then, you know, if the customer by then is frustrated and thinks they're dealing with a robot, the poor human employee may uh, not have a very pleasant time with that conversation. So what I would really love, what I would love linguists to design for me is some kind of very polite, in-context way to ask a question or interact with one of these bots that would reveal whether it is a human or a computer, like some kind of shibboleth that is nevertheless, you know, not like asking about his favorite Star Wars character, because that is, you know, that's impolite if you're talking to a human employee, but you know, some phrasing or something that's tricky. That's an interesting question, because I think a lot of times, you know, asking for something that's a little bit Mm non-cooperative, like how many giraffes sort of out of the blue, is maybe going to deliver that that answer. But it's also going to be kind of confusing and annoying to a human. Yeah, exactly. So my default has always been assume it's a human, because, you know, better to be polite to a computer than rude to a human sort of thing. Mm. But it would be lovely to be able to tell the difference. I mean, companies should just tell us or have us talk to a human button or something, but... Yeah. Yeah. So you're kind of looking for like an inverse Turing test. Like, yeah. so a Turing test is this classic test in computer conversation where if a computer can fool a human into thinking that they're talking to another human, then they've passed the Turing test. And there are sorts of ways of passing the Turing test if you constrain the context enough. Mm-hmm. Um, or if you, if you tell people that they're talking to a child or they're talking to somebody who's on, uh, on some drugs or something like this and you can, or a philosopher, uh, <laughs> then they'll more likely to believe 
<laughs> these are the three kinds of, of, of people that a robot can be. <laughs> uh, but if you try to do something that's very practical or that has, you know, is grounded very much in reality, then people aren't as willing to be generous with the computer's misinterpretations. So, Janelle, your blog posts that you make the neural nets do funny things, they're really funny. And yet, I have a feeling that it's not only that the neural nets are funny, it's also that you're really good at spotting the funny bits and bringing them out to a blog post for us. Yeah, I know there's a lot of human storytelling work that goes on. So how is this going to be interesting? Where's the funny thing that it's doing? Sometimes it's the ratio is like a 100 to 1 of things that aren't very funny that it generates. And the one thing that I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm posting that. Because I guess the thing about it being a computer process is that you could just generate infinite numbers of nonsensical ice cream names, but a lot of those are too nonsensical to even be particularly amusing. Yeah, and it also has a tendency to, especially if we're dealing with something shortish and simplish like ice cream, then it'll generate something and it says mint chocolate chip. And I'm like, oh, it just copied <laughs> that. It learned that one. It learned that one too well. Yeah, because as far as these AIs are concerned, exactly copying my examples is a perfect solution to the question I'm asking of it. If it can predict every single word, <laughs> word for word, you know, in the text file that I gave it, then that is a perfect score. And so I sometimes it's almost like a battle for me to try to get it to be just bad enough at the task. Yeah, not so bad that it's incoherent, but just like bad enough that it's yeah. humans can resolve what it's supposed to mean. Yeah. And it's still funny. One application of uh, this name generation process you've been doing was when you created a list of <laughs> craft beer names, and a company actually took one of those names to create a beer. Was that a process that you embarked on because you thought this was a good place to kind of experiment with creative naming, or how did that come about? Yeah, this was one of the things where I happened to know somebody who was friends with the owner of the brewery. And I thought, well, this would be fun to actually get one of these beers to exist in real life because people keep saying that the names the AIs are generating are pretty good. In the case of craft beer names, there have actually been beer companies who have taken each other to court over having beer names that were too close to one another. So there's this kind of a need to maybe show that there are ways to still come up with new beer names. And we hadn't exhausted all the possibilities yet. And so it's really a collaboration between you and the AI where you are curating all of the names that it gives you in order to find the ones that have that perfect balance of kind of following the rules you've given it, but with a bit of a lateral thinking approach. Yeah, and just the right amount of lateral thinking as well, too. Sometimes it's way off the mark and comes up with, I don't know, you know, farm fight as a name for a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Here are some of the beer names that were on the list, uh, like Dang River mm. and Bingleszard Flack and Toe Deal and Devil's Chard. <laughs> Some of them, like I can almost imagine being a craft beer. Uh, in the end, it was the fine stranger that was bottled and labeled. Hmm, that's good. And I think like the examples are, are very funny, but there's also sort of an important part of making a lot of funny examples for AI. It's not just like to entertain people, even though it is very entertaining. Yeah, there's people using these practically as their business uh, in coming up with brand names. So, you know, I did this one beer. I don't do, there's a whole art to naming brands. And it's not just coming up with the names, but it's also this whole framing of, you know, because of the etymology of this and that, or because the computer mashed this together with that. So there's definitely a storytelling element to it as well. And so when I was kind of going through this process with the beer, I was definitely getting the sense of, oh yeah, I've got all these great names, you know, any, not any one of these, but many of them <laughs> would make great beer names and the beer would sell well and the brewer would be happy with it. But yeah, how do I kind of put it on the marquee or put it on the silver platter and make them actually say, yes, the authority has spoken, this is the name. And beyond brand names, there are also lots of other practical applications people are using artificial intelligence for now, whether that's 
you know, machine translation or self-driving cars or all of these sorts of like very practical aspects to things. But it's hard to like see the inside of self-driving car, what that looks like, uh, and how it's making problems for things, whereas it's easier to kind of see what happens when you make a bunch of weird ice cream flavors. Yeah, exactly. That's why I like doing these kinds of uh, tests. It's, you know, some of the biggest applications for AI is in, you know, doing financial predictions or looking for fraudulent logins and things like that, where it maybe is comprehensible to somebody who's in that field. But, you know, the way that they're making mistakes in that field is not very obvious, not very interesting if you're not like right there in that field working with these kinds of numbers all the time. But if it's making a mistake on an ice cream flavor, that is much faster to see. Oh, yeah, it's doing pattern matching. Oh, yeah, it doesn't understand what it's doing. A lot of these same mistakes really do translate over to commercial applications. So we've talked a little bit about how you have to curate mm. the output because it will just keep spitting out silly ice cream names forever. And we've talked a little bit about some of the problems with the types of data that are put into these processes in terms of, you know, if you don't set it up very well and you have people answering questions about giraffes in a way that the AI is going to implement weirdly. But there are bigger and more serious implications for thinking about the kind of data that we are using to create artificial intelligence processes, not just with language, but particularly kind of for this topic, looking at the the kinds of data that people use to build artificial intelligence. Um, and you talk about this a bit in your book. Where do you see some of the biggest challenges in creating good AI? Yeah, so one of the things is that, remember, these AIs are, they have about the raw computing power of an earthworm, and they don't have the context then to realize that there are some things that the humans do that they probably shouldn't be copying. And so completely unknowingly, they will copy things like racial gender discrimination, and they won't know that that's what they're doing. They won't know that that's a bad thing. So they just really can't comprehend it. So it's kind of like the chat bot that figures, oh, if I just answer yes to everything, I'll get 80% accuracy, even though it's not actually useful communicatively to just answer yes to everything. Yeah, it's like, this is exactly what you have asked for, but it's not necessarily what you want. And so when we give it a bunch of human decisions on resume sorting, for example, and we tell it, copy these human decisions, then uh, these algorithms can look and say, well... You know, this is a very difficult problem, but looks like all of the applicants who have gone to this one college are, tend not to be hired. And, oh, that college is a women's college, and it is implementing these, you know, gender discrimination that it's seeing in its training data because it saw this signal, didn't know what it was, only knew that it was helping it copy the humans a little better. Right. And so if the humans are already having their sorts of bias, the AI can kind of magnify that bias like if you have a human that's answering yes 80% of the time, and now the AI is answering yes 100% of the time, and it doesn't know what it's doing. Exactly. Yeah. And they are so good about being sneaky about, you know, like you can, you may think that if you set up what, what, you know, a resume sorting algorithm, say, well, we're not just, we're just not going to tell it what gender any of these applicants are. And it is very good at figuring this out, like not just through colleges, but through, you know, if somebody has their extracurriculars listed and women's soccer team is on there, it will, it will glom onto that. Or even subtleties with uh, word choice and phrasing, it will start using those kinds of trends and use them to copy the humans better. <laughs> Or I'm thinking about a, a different resume study, which showed that people, they had the same sorts of resumes, people with, her, with a white sounding name versus with a black sounding name were more likely to get a uh, call back for interviews. And so you could imagine an AI that actually just learns how to predict based on someone's name, like, oh, we've hired a lot of people named Mike at this company. You know, like, we all know these companies that have like a whole <laughs> bunch of people named Mike and Adam and stuff. Um, yeah. So like, maybe we should just only interview the people named Mike. Yeah, it will, it will absolutely do that sort of thing. And, you know, and so you see, there's a, there's a lot of companies out there that are offering resume screening, but knowing what I know about how commonly these AIs can pick up on this kind of bias, uh, I would not want one of these programs screening 
resumes for my company, for example, or I would at the very least demand to see the evidence that this thing is not making biased decisions. Right. And that's the sort of way of saying, okay, well, if this AI still thinks slime is a good flavor for ice cream, (laughs) then (laughs) really, how much can we trust it to make a good decision about resumes? Yeah. And I, th- and I think, you know, that's almost the counterintuitive danger about AI in a lot of ways. It's not that it's too smart and it's going to take over the world and it's not going to obey the humans. <laughs> no, the problem is that it's not smart enough to realize what we're actually trying to ask it to do. And it keeps obeying us too well in ways that we don't want it to. Yeah. If it can, when it comes to language generation, language processing, human language is really, really difficult. So that particular domain, more than a lot of others, you'll see these AIs that are really struggling to get a handle on what the humans are saying. So it's good news that linguists will have jobs for a little bit longer. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. One of the questions that really came up in my mind when we were thinking about interviewing you was, can the AI take my job as the co-host of the podcast Link Enthusiasm? <laughs> if Lauren and I want to go live on a beach somewhere, can we replace as co-hosts a bot-generated Gretchen and Lauren to run this podcast? Lauren, what do you think? <laughs> we actually put this to Janelle a few years ago, back when we had started releasing transcripts for our early episodes. And about three years ago in 2016, 2017, we didn't have many episodes, so we didn't have a lot of data to work with. But also, it seems like in these last few years, the ability to process larger text has gotten better. Would that be the case, Janelle? Yeah, that's definitely the case. So the kinds of things I was doing in 2016, generating words, short phrases, just, you know, paint color names, ice cream flavor names, those sorts of things. I wouldn't think of tackling entire sentences or let alone sentences that follow one another that make sense. But now just pretty much in the last year, there's been some really big AIs that have been trained on millions of pages from the internet, and they are much better at generating text. Like they can generate grammatical sentences most of the time now, and most of the words that they use are real words. They still don't understand what they're saying, but yeah, it has gotten better. And so you can potentially take uh, something that's been trained on, you know, let's say most of the English pages of the internet, um, yeah. and then sort of fine tune it on a smaller data set to try to like push it more in the direction of just for a random example, Lingthusiasm episodes. Yes. If hypothetically I had, you know, many episodes worth of Lingthusiasm transcripts, I might be able to make a Robo Gretchen and a Robo Lauren. Because do you know what else has happened in the last couple of years, Gretchen? Uh, I think we've produced a lot more episodes of Lingthusiasm. Between the main episodes and the bonus episodes, we have 70 transcripts, which is over 800 pages of data. Janelle, would that be enough to have a go at creating a Robo Gretchen and a Robo Lauren? There's one way to find out. (laughs) Oh boy. Let's do (laughs) some live neural netting on the podcast. All right. (laughs) What could possibly go wrong? (laughs) Okay. So can you walk us through like, what are you doing right now on your computer? Okay. So Janelle's going to share her computer with us uh, so that we can see what's happening, but we might get some screen grabs as we go through. We may put some links into the show notes if there's stuff that's visual that's hard to see as well. So what we're looking at right now, this is actually just a browser window in Chrome. Uh, And what I'm looking at is a thing that is an interface to an AI that's being hosted on Google's computers right now. So Google okay. is graciously allowing people to use their powerful uh, computers that are spe- pretty specialized for these kinds of calculations. So even though I am working on a fairly ordinary laptop, I'm able to connect to some fairly serious firepower here. It's really interesting to get to see kind of under the hood of making an AI run. So I think we'll give people a bit of a taste of that here. But if you want more details and more of an explanation of how we made robot enthusiasm, uh, we'll, we'll make that into a bonus episode. 
So here we are. I've connected to this AI. I've downloaded a copy of it. And now I'm going to upload lingthusiasm.txt. I'm going to upload this file of 2.4 megabytes of YouTube talking. So let's see. Okay, we've got our first sample out here right now. It is already conversations. <laughs> Except it's just conversation by someone called Jaina. <laughs> Maybe this is the hybrid between the two of us, our merge alter ego. Shall we read a few of these lines, Lauren? So I think we should each start with Gina as we're saying as we're reading the lines. Okay. So first line. This is the this is the first of Gina's lines. Gina, yeah, that's why I'm going to be honest with you. Gina, we're not always going to be like, oh, we don't know why we did that. That's why. Gina, I know, the people who have come to me to ask me are going to be like, yeah, I didn't know who was getting up and down the stairs and going to a doctor's appointment. Okay, so not very lingthusiasm in content there, but I like where Jean is going. Yeah, I like that it's getting a, a dialogue thing. Yeah. We're pleased to announce that, in fact, your lingthusiasm hosts will be replaced by robots, but only for one episode, and it will be a bonus, and it will be very, very funny. So you can go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm to listen to the next bonus episode, which will be uh, written by robots and performed by you and me, Lauren. To listen to that bonus episode, check out patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, and you can hear us reading some of our favorite examples. We will also give patrons access to some of those reams of examples, so you can find ones that make you chortle as well. Um, we'll have some screenshots from the AI building process for patrons as well. But thank you so much, Janelle, for taking us through the process of actually training a neural net artificial intelligence and showing us some of the pitfalls and some of the challenges uh, and for talking to us today if people want to read more about how artificial intelligence is making the world weirder and more wonderful and some of the challenges and limitations your book is you look like a thing and i love you and i loved reading it Yes, I can personally attest that I got my copy the night before my book came out when I was very distracted and it successfully distracted me for several hours while I was kind of waiting for that countdown of midnight uh, to have that happen. Nice. So it has lots of fun pictures of weird things that the AI are doing as well. And thanks again for coming on the show. Oh, it was my pleasure. This was a lot of fun. I love listening to your very strange uh, generated conversations. <laughs> enthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, including extended versions of AI-generated Lingthusiasm transcripts, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, IPA socks, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. Janelle Shane is at Janelle C. Shane on Twitter. Her blog is aiweirdness.com, and her book is You Look Like a Thing and I Love You. To listen to bonus episodes and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include future English, onomatopoeia, and linguistics fiction. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gaughan, and our editorial producer is Sarah Dabirella. And our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!